when will it ever end? Oh, hello. Welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine war news update for the 29th of May 2023 in the seemingly interminable war in Ukraine. Let's go to our usual opening gambit, the uh, general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. Liquidated personnel is there or thereabouts. Been hanging around the four to 600 mark for a couple of weeks. Four tanks, 11 APCs. 11 APCs is a fairly uh, tough number for the Russians, although we have seen higher. Four tanks. Tanks are generally around that mark at the moment. Uh, I've got an article to refer to talking about how the Russians have started using their tanks far more cautiously. 10 artillery systems, one MLRS. That is... It, well, it's low for the last couple of weeks. We had stupendously high numbers of artillery being targeted by the Ukrainians. The Russians have lost masses of artillery systems and pieces. Well, 10 is still fairly significant, 10 and 1, uh, but that is relatively low. Two anti-aircraft warfare systems, that is a TOR system and an S-300, so pretty decent haul for the uh, Ukrainians yesterday, S-300 is is a, uh, a a decent target to have taken out 61 drones and there's a massive drone and cruise missile attack last night which has its own colored tab uh, lots of stuff on that but that doesn't include these figures are not referring to last night but actually the night before uh, 15 uh, vehicles and fuel tanks uh, and you'll see some of those in a second uh, get taken out and two pieces of special equipment and I'll show you one of those uh, in Bakhmut. That's usually electronic warfare equipment that doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, the general staff has said that uh, during the past day reconnaissance drones was destroyed, missile troops and artillery units were hit. Three areas, so artillery units are you know enemy number one at the moment. Uh, three areas of concentration of weapons and military equipment, S-300 anti-aircraft missile complex and a TOR anti-aircraft missile complex, six control points, electronic warfare station, artillery unit in a firing position and a Russian ammunition depot. Right, here is a, not unusually another montage of FPV drones. And what's significant about these, apart from one uh, I think that that possibly was a tank and one multiple launch rocket system. Most of the things getting hit here are logistics trucks and vans and SUVs and whatnot, quite far apparently quite far behind Russian enemy lines behind the front line. That's the uh, looks like the multiple launch rocket system. I could be wrong though. Uh, and this shows perhaps a desire for the Ukrainians to mess with Russian logistics to hit things where they think they're safe and uh, and to you know mess things up for the Russians in terms of getting equipment from A to B, so on and so forth. Anyway, lots of footage of FPV drones. These They're making these at a, at a tremendously uh, high rate. Uh, they're kicking out a bunch of these, both from the UK and Escadrone, uh, which is a, a volunteer, I think, organisation in Ukraine making these FPV drones and then they attach RPG warheads and other munitions to them and then take out all sorts of stuff. They are becoming a real problem for the Russians where Lancet drones have been a real problem for the Ukrainians. We suddenly, they've dried up, footage of that has dried up, haven't seen any Lancet drone footage recently. So Russians, I don't know if they've run out of those, but the Ukrainians have certainly not run out of FPV drones that appear to be uh, really, really challenging for the Russians. Anyway, let's look at that piece of electronic warfare or ele um, some EW kit in Solodar in Bakhmut this. And this is taken out with several hits, uh, ammunition, sorry, artillery hits. Oh, it's early. It's a bank holiday today. Just got out of bed. Uh, so as you can see there, one hit and, and then another and then another I don't know if that is part of the system there. It looks like it, doesn't it? Um, whether they whether they get to take that out or not, I don't know. But that's, yeah, electronic warfare kit being hit by the Russians. In fact, by the Ukrainians, sorry. In fact, there's there's another one. So that this piece of footage has two getting taken out. Um, and they kind of put them everywhere. You see these in, in, in amongst the trees, on top of, buildings just uh, that's on top of a half destroyed uh, residential house uh, we've seen them on top of tall high-rise buildings in fact there was 
a high mars strike i think on donetsk city on a building and i think that was had stuff on top of it as well anyway moving on russian howitzers in temporarily occupied bilgorod so they are targeting and this has been geolocated the the, the these are several uh, howitzers taken out in russian territory so that is you know it shows that they are taking counter battery fire very seriously looking at, at taking out russian artillery all up and down the front line and inside Russia itself. Um, Russian sources report that Ukraine attacked the Shebekino checkpoint 50 metres from the border with six kamikaze drones yesterday evening. Almost all drones missed their target, according to the Russians. Uh, they also report there were no casualties or damage, uh, although I have seen footage of that checkpoint, I think, looking rather worse for wear. Uh, I haven't got that here. This is just um, of you know pictures of the smoke that's come from that. But there is some drone footage that I've seen that that show that yeah maybe the Russians are spinning that somewhat. Um, anyway, uh, update in to in total. So this is referring to not last night's drone attack, but the drone attack before. Where I think I said something like forty out of forty two drones were taken out. It turns out it was. 58 out of 59 of them were taken out with the, with the updated figures. So it's a massive drone attack two nights ago. Um, but what, as I said, what goes up must come down. And quite often, or almost always, these cause a problem. Unless they're landing in the middle of a field, and I'll show you an image of that in a second, these things can cause damage when they fall down. A fire, in fact, a massive fire started two nights ago in Kiev as a result of that. So even though they are more often than not, you know, to a huge degree, actually really good interception rates shot down, they still cause issues, even if it isn't at, the, at their intended target position. Okay, remember, I'm going to talk about last night's attacks in a second. But let's just go through how, well, there was a whole plethora of targets uh, taken out in southern Ukraine, we're talking Mariupol, Berdyansk, Melitopol, all those kind of places. Again, they are just getting hammered on a, on a nightly basis or daily basis. In Mariupol, air defense located near Stary Krim, shot at something near um, Alaska. Uh, at least six volleys of anti-aircraft missiles were fired around Mariupol, including one volley uh, in each of Stary Krim, Mangush and Nikolska. Unconfirmed reports of strikes on Nikolska, report of a fire in the Uzruf. Reports of a strike in Yurivka, and that I think has had confirmed at least from the Russians themselves, at least 20 dead Russians. Uh, air defense actives in Berdyansk, Anova Petrivka, uh, Komish Zoria, uh, Volnovaka, which is further up near Vuhledar, um, Mariupol, the strike caught on camera there. Uh, as it pans around, there's a big explosion in the distance. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, ambulances in Mariupol have called out. Um, air defense is going off. Unconfirmed strikes on Andrivka and Novotroyska. Um, just st stuff going on all over the shop. There's uh, another video of the explosion in Mariupol, I think, uh, just a bit closer there. Um, corpses of Russians are being unloaded from the building of military headquarters in Nikolsky, where the occupiers were located. Not as impressive as Yurievka, but no less effective. So there was some really significant, and there's Yurievka, there's footage of that at night being hit. Reports of a strike on Olnika. I mean, I'm not telling you where all these are, but you can see on a map, it's all over the shop. The, the Ukrainians are hitting um, the Russian Russians in those places where before they couldn't get uh, as a result of the range of the high mars well now with storm shadow and possibly other munitions they are just freely taking out these these places and yesterday was a really big day for russians getting hit deep into their lines reports of russians being rushed to hospital in mariupol looks like ukraine hit a russian headquarters in berdyansk the administration of the shumilinsky municipal district of the republic of chuvash in russia announced the death of mayor Ilya Ortikov, who was present when a headquarter was struck in Berdyansk on May the 25th. So that's now four days ago, but just goes to show that this sort of stuff has been happening. Targets being hit. Uh, we might not hear so much about it because obviously it's in within Russian, deep within Russian lines. Uh, but 
rest assured that every day they are shaping that battlefield uh, with the ca- coming counteroffensive in mind. And then you know, Defmon reports about uh, reports on many of those same places that you heard getting hit. Um, maximum anxiety in Belgorod as well. Uh, Yurivka, where uh, apparently over 20, 20 Russians perished. Um, so on and so forth. Yep, 20 confirmed, according to Russian Telegram, 20 confirmed dead in Yurivka, so on and so forth. Just loads and loads of activity yesterday from the Ukrainians. And that's on a day that the Defence Minister Alexei Reznikov stated that 100% of storm shadows have found their targets. Now, this is in light of the Russians claiming to be shooting these down uh, quite often. Uh, but they have claimed this previously. Uh, Perrin's video talked about how inaccurate they are with their claims. They've claimed to shoot down ammunition that hasn't even arrived in Ukraine yet. They've claimed to have shot, shot down Brad, you know, destroyed Bradley's months before they even arrived in Ukraine. We just can't take them seriously. So have 100% reached their targets accurately? It's possible, even plausible. Have the Russians shot any of these down? It's possible, even plausible. Who Who's more known for telling the truth? The Ukrainians. Are the Russians? No, not at all. Uh, the, the complete fabrication. Uh, to fanciful levels. So when I have these two competing hypotheses, uh, 100% of them have found their target, and yeah, we're shooting them, we're shooting loads of them down. I generally believe the Ukrainians until, you know, presented with evidence uh, against that. Um, Trent Zelenko, another thread about this kind of range of long distance, you know, I guess medium range uh, munitions. Well, I don't know longer medium range munitions such as Storm Shadow that, that are hitting over the high mars range of sort of 80 kilometers. So uh, third thread detailing the hollowing out of Russian 70 kilometer to, to 250 kilometer area logistics in southern occupied Ukraine. The context of the these actions is Ukraine has killed more than 600 artillery, Russian, Russian artillery systems from 82 millimeter mortars to 300 millimeters multiple launch rocket systems since mid-April 2023. Uh, now it is systematically killing the shell depots, transport, command posts, and ground-based air defences, protecting the previous three listed defences. Ukraine has thinned out the Russian artillery firepower needed to stop a break-in. Now it is killing the logistics the Russian armed forces need. To move mobile reserves to prevent a Ukrainian operational breakthrough to the shores of the Sea of Azov. This would be a successful Ukrainian offensive roughly the same size of Kharkiv in September 2022. In other words, the Ukrainians are doing all the right things ahead of a big counteroffensive into the southern regions, and they are successfully hammering both Russian air defences, depots, and logistics. You know, they, they seem to be doing a really good job. Okay, Talking about tank losses, heavy Russian heavy tank and armored vehicle losses have led Russia to change its tactics. This is a report by Business Insider. Russia is demonstrating increasing caution with its tanks and also working to hide them. Russia is being more cautious with its tanks and trying to hide them after heavy losses in battle, but it's shooting itself in the foot, says the article. The kind of head... The executive summary is heavy Russian tank and armored vehicle losses have led Russia to change its tactics, face threats from enemy tanks as well as weapons carried by dismounted infantry. Russia is demonstrating increasing caution with its tanks and also working to hide them. And of course, with that caution, it means that they are less able to use them effectively in a in an offensive capability. Um, so if I go to yeah, uh, Let's here we are. While this Russian, while this approach helps reduce losses, so they're hiding them, they're using them uh, in in a different way. Uh, in fact, I think it talks about them using them as um, art, almost as artillery, as I've talked about before. Yes, it's just the uh, paragraph ahead uh, above. Uh, Though Russia has used some of its older tanks to support breach operations in urban combat, such as in Bakhmut, although they use very few, tanks are largely being used as artillery and fire support and to raid Ukrainian positions. While this approach helps reduce losses, it prevents Russia from leveraging the firepower, mobility and shock factor that tanks bring to the table to deliver breakthroughs and exploit gains on the battlefield, limiting Russia's overall offensive capability. Russia's winter offensive captured very little ground, roughly 
870 kilometers from December to May at the cost of over 100,000 casualties, according to US estimates. Russia has put its dead and wounded figures significantly lower. In their report on shifts in Russian battlefield behavior, Watling and Reynolds, and I've referred to their report on the, the their how they've adapted previously, noted that Russians have begun modifying their tanks to hide them from anti-tank guided missiles that have had a devastating effect on Russian armour, specifically the thermal targeting sensors that spot them. Vehicles and defensive positions are being fitted with anti-thermal material. The engine deck and resulting heat plume have been altered, reducing the reliability of anti-tank guided missiles, which can use infrared sensors to lock onto a target. And the Russians are changing the times of day they fight in trying to conceal its armor from Russian, sorry, Ukrainian missile systems. Russian forces have found that fighting at dusk and dawn, when the vehicle temperature is most similar to the ambient temperature of the surroundings, is beneficial. Uh, but of course, you know, this then presents problems for their offensives as well. So the more cautious and defensive you're being effectively, the less effective, the less, as they say in the report, the less you can leverage that firepower. Uh, so yeah, you'll lose fewer, but they they will take fewer um, casualties themselves. You know, swings and roundabouts, I guess. Um, now, uh, yeah, Tim White has talked a lot uh, in his threads about the hits on Russia uh, with those those missiles, but as ever, he has a lot of on Russia on fire. So another couple of examples of careless smoking become evident in Russia. Fire completely destroyed this hotel in the coastal resort of Zhuga in the Krasnodar region. Uh, no casualties. So that is just over from the Kerch Bridge. That's the Krasnodar region. And another chapter of Russia on fire happened in Tatarstan. A fire uh, happened near Yelabuga. A cake shop was the first to go up in flames. And then, you know, it doesn't stop there. A warehouse in the suburb of St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg caught fire. A uh, big fire there. Um, we have uh, in Chelya Binsk, a warehouse with wood is burning. The fire is 2,600 square meters. Um, it's now been uh, extinguished, I think. But as I say here, less wood use, uh, can be used for trenches. So the idea is that that could be wood that they use to construct the, the, the trenches in Ukraine. So, uh, yeah. There are so many fires in Russia, it's ridiculous. It must be a real headache for their emergency services. Right, moving on to what happened last night particularly. A massive cruise missile and drone attack. Air defences shot down 37 of 40 X-101 KH-555 cruise missiles. So that's a really good interception rate. That's 92%. Uh, 29 of 35 Shahid-136 kamikaze drones. And that's 82% of drones. So that is, again, really good. But that still means that six drones got through uh, and a couple of cruise missiles got through and they would have caused problems. But also, when these things come down, as I've mentioned, they still cause problems. So it was a really sort of terrible night, I guess, across Ukraine. And so there were, I mean, this is from Lviv in the west over to uh, Kiev in, in the, well, more, more in the center towards the east. Ukrainian air defense down 37 uh, Russian missiles and 29 Shahid drones in one of the largest night attacks today. However, Russia, the Russians managed to hit a military object, presumably an airfield near Ukraine's Kamelnitsky, according to Ukrainian authorities. So that's a, a town more, more in the center as well. Currently, the extension of fires and fuel lubricant and warehouses and storage of combat materialist assets is ongoing. Five aerial vehicles were damaged. The repair on the runway has begun. Begun already. So that is a really significant hit. If the Ukrainians are admitting that five possibly helicopters or, or jets have been damaged or maybe by reactor drones, I don't know. Uh, that, that is, uh, have they been completely destroyed? Are they inoperable? That is really significant. So the Russians are going to want to take out the Ukrainians' ability to fire Storm Shadow missiles and do all that stuff that we've already seen. They want to be hitting uh, military air bases. I would suggest that would be their, should be their target, their number one target. Um, whether that was what they intended last night, but they just lost most of the stuff that they shot into Ukraine, I don't know. But it's certainly something has hit an airbase and that will really hurt the Ukrainians. Um as Tim uh 
Tim White says, once again, you know, the Russians are hammering the uh, the Ukrainians, and he reported throughout the night of, of stuff taking place, people going to um, air raid shelters in, in Kiev. One of the metro stations was closed where people were trying to get in, uh, pretty upset. Uh, but yeah, cruise missiles being launched from both the north and the south by the looks of it. So we have this situation where the Ukrainians are under quite a lot of pressure. The Russians are, are being a little bit more clever with how they send their uh, cruise missiles and drones and they send them from different directions uh, sometimes I think the the one that uh, went uh, and damaged the Patriot missile system I think they timed everything including you know the drones and the cruise missiles to hit Kiev at the same time so you get that overwhelming of the air defenses or the intended overwhelming of the air defenses so they are being a little bit more clever with how they do these things it's just that the ukraine ha that ukraine has a much better air defense network now but that but that's probably the case around places like kiev and maybe other major cities but do they have that coverage across ukraine uh, around air bases do that what kind of air defense systems they have set up at all their military air bases around ukraine they can't afford to put the very best air defenses you know everywhere at all their most sensitive targets so there will be some sensitive targets that will be weakly defended um it's it's like so, it, perum talked about it being a bit like a, a, a small blanket you've only got a small blanket to cover the whole of ukraine and if you pull it over here to cover these parts then it's going to leave some gaps over there and then you pull the bl blanket back and you know it's just not big enough to cover the whole of ukraine i think that's a nice analogy to give you an understanding of the challenges that ukraine had so yeah loads of uh talk last night loads of uh, about about this attack there have been loads of explosions uh, as debris has fallen down um, and this you know as you can see just explosions reported well, that's in Kamelnitsky at the airbase there. Uh, but dozens of blasts heard in Kiev in 15 minutes, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll just uh, move on, just show you a little bit more footage. This is of, I won't show you, I, I'd love to play you the sound to this because actually uh, it's really, really effective. Like it's a wow, you kind of really understand how you know how noisy and how you know, what what the the soundscape of these uh, air defenses are but it's then overlaid with a bunch of music and i'll just be hit with a copyright infringement but here you've got a small arms and probably slightly larger arms being absolutely you know there's a lot of lead being thrown into the sky here and they do actually successfully hit the drone and take it down and it explodes so yeah you the you can be successful with small lines fire. Whether there was also things like Gepards working, I don't know. Um, but as as you can see here, you get sizable um, craters even when you do successfully take down a drone. So that drone has caused a huge crater there. And imagine that's in a metropolitan area. You are going to have issues with buildings being damaged. Here's another crater. Might not might not look the hugest of craters but imagine that landing on your house or some significant piece of infrastructure in a town so it might not be the intended tar target but can still do some serious damage anyway uh, there will be a lot of uh, a lot of talk i guess today of the outcomes of that attack um we will we'll see how it develops um here we have bakhmut and i'm only just giving you an intro into uh, talking about Bakhmut in a, in a little bit in a second. Here we have some more footage to show you the the massive destruction of Bakhmut and what liberation looks like. I know I've shown you plenty of these before, but you know it's always worth reminding ourselves of the ramifications of war and what Russian liberation really is. It's just a synonym for destruction, and it's still taking place at the moment. Bakhmut will be pummeled. Now it will be being pummeled by the Ukrainians, I would have thought. Uh, Prigozhin, so this is my introduction to Bakhmut. Prigozhin indicates possible delay of Russian relief operation in Bakhmut, which is the relief of the Wagner PMC troops. Uh, the DPR, the 
Donetsk People's Republic, or DNR, uh, troops replace them within the city, and I think other other forces are replacing them in the city as well. Things like the VDB, the airborne troops, but also on the flanks. And I wonder whether this relief operation is being hindered by the activities of the Ukrainians in terms of their uh, their artillery attacks on back on and around Bakhmut and trying to trying to hinder that relief operation directly, or whether it's just Progression realizing that Wagner need to hang on a little bit because actually the Ukrainians are pushing on the flanks quite successfully. And in fact, well, as it says here, the Washington Post reported on the 28th that Ukrainian personnel in the Bakhmut area have witnessed Wagner forces departing from Bakhmut city itself with regular Russian personnel assuming control of Wagner's former positions in the city. So it is happening, just Progression is indicating not as quickly as he was originally intending. Uh, and then on to uh, and I will just say, as a quick one here, it looks like the Ukrainians have made some advances, at least according to record, reporting from Ukraine, around Klyshchivka as they are, are attacking Klyshchivka from two different angles. Uh, but this, I think, is a really significant indication as to the success of the Ukrainians and a lack of success of the Russians. The Kremlin is on its fourth commander since February 2022. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, has only had one, Valery Zeluzhny, the commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces, who has come back from the dead. So he's he's not only pretty awesome, but he appears to be a member of the undead, which is impressive. None, of, uh, But seriously, though, r many of the decisions Russia makes... So I always talk about there being two hypotheses, right? Things are going well for Russia and things are going badly for Russia. And when you look at the data, which hypothesis is better supported? So when you look at look at any piece of news that says Russia is sacking this commander or moving this commander or demoting this commander, Russia is moving this one in, changing this, doing that, all the time that data supports the hypothesis that Russia are not doing very well. If Russia were doing really well, you don't change something that's not, not broken. Right, you don't fix something ain't broke. So, if Russia were doing really well, they wouldn't be changing stuff up. They're changing stuff up because that because they are doing so badly, and this is their own implicit admission. And Ukraine still have Zeluzhny in place. Who's doing well? Who's doing badly? I'll let you decide. But I think I've just given you the conclusion. Right. Uh, moving on to military aid, there's really not a lot to say here. It's all kind of been done and dusted, and we're just waiting for the counteroffensive. It appears we're in that kind of a zone. A European people's bond could support Ukraine's reconstruction. Canada has shown a way in connecting public support for Kyiv with investment opportunities. So this is something that I think the EU are considering. The FT talks about this. Last year, the Canadian government showed the way. It issued a five-year, $500 million Canadian dollar Ukraine sovereignty bond. What are bonds? Bonds are government, uh, government bonds represent debt that is issued by government and sold to investors to support government spending. Some government bonds may pay periodic interest payments. Other government bonds do not pay coupons and are sold at a discount instead. Government bonds are considered low-risk investments since the government backs them. The various types of bonds that are offered by the US Treasury are considered to be among the safest in the world. In other words, you're going to get your, you're going to get that money back and a little bit, but it's kind of because it's low risk, you don't get very high uh, percentage, you know, so the return on investment is very is somewhat low, but it's just a safe investment. And they generally sell them only to banks and stuff. And they'll just buy loads of them. And it's just a way of getting uh, money, I guess. Because of their relatively low risk, government bonds typically pay low interest rates. Yeah. So to go back in denominations as small as Canadian dollar, 100 Canadian dollars, targeted to retail investors, retail investors through a network of 10 Canadian financial institutions. The proceeds, so these aren't ones sold to banks like you would normally get. These are aimed at people, you know, people in the retail market. And that's why they're, they're small denominations. Um, uh, through a network of 10 Canadian financial institutions, the proceeds from the bond go directly via the IMF, International Monetary Fund, to supporting Ukraine. But investors purchase the equivalent of normal Canadian government bonds backed by Ottawa's AAA rating and upon maturity to be repaid by the Canadian government. So on and so forth. It talks about how this could be uh, a model for Europe to, to copy as well. Uh, so that's a nice way, uh, possibly, or a different way to support 
Ukraine. And then Mick Ryan here, retired general, Australian general, talks about as the government, so he's talking about the Australian government, wisely endorsed the procurement of replacement M1 tanks in the budget. So they're replacing some equipment uh, at the moment. Providing our current generation tanks to Ukraine makes a lot of sense. It's not saying they do that, but I think he's advocating they should do that. Plus Hawke and more Bushmasters to replace battle losses. So this is uh, Alexei Reznikov pretty much asking the Australians to continue helping them. So dear Australian friends throughout history, you have repeatedly proven the Australians are a nation of freedom loving warriors who always stand up to a bully. There's nothing like flattery. There's nothing like flattery to get what you want. Uh, you are 15,000 kilometers away, yet we are very close in our shared values and readiness to defend them. Talk about un unity here. Always the language of the Ukrainians is, is always really positive and makes you feel good and Obviously, the intention is that they get what they want, right? Language is important. That's why during the first months of the Russian aggression, Australia was the largest contributor to Ukraine outside of NATO. So again, uh, flattery, but also a uh, bit of data there. And it shows that Australia, yay, you're already awesome. Uh, why didn't you continue being awesome? Your Bushmasters have been incredible in real combat operations. The stuff you've given us is genuinely good. Uh, but our fight for global freedom is not over yet, and we still need your support. I encourage you today to join the International Tank Coalition for Ukraine. In addition to tanks, we could be, uh, we would be honoured to receive the Australian Hawkies. Uh, they would prove invaluable to our troop, our troops during the counteroffensive. When I used to teach writing, I used to teach um, uh, persuasive writing, and all the the elements of persuasive writing are pr pretty much here he's, he's using all of them and one of them is dare dare the person to disagree or like or you you assume it's like i've talked about this before with when you speak to your children say oh thank you for doing the washing up and like hang on we but i'm not doing the washing up yeah no thank you for doing the washing up oh okay i'll do the washing up then and this is what happened with the british challenger tanks which is like oh thank you for giving us a further further dozen challenger tanks and britain was like hang on we've, we've given you 14 we're not we've not said we're going to give you any more are we are we going to give them more we better give them some more quick go and give them some more it turns out you know from what i can understand uh you know on the on the slide we have given them double the amount of challenger tanks so i think this is again <laughs> ukraine saying yeah uh we'd be honored we'd be a thank you we'd be honored to receive the that australian kit and the australians are like did you promise that Oh, I didn't do it, did you? So yeah, it's always a pretty clever way of very persuasively getting what you want. Uh, they could provide invaluable to our troops during the counteroffensive. Stand with Ukraine. Together we can defend our shared values against really emotive language. Uh, together we can and will achieve victory. Uh, just perfect example of, of persuasive writing, really. Um, there you go. And and for, for all the right reasons. That, that's not a criticism. That is, yep, I totally agree with that. Do it. Do it. Do it. Uh, now moving on to geop uh, geopolitical uh, things. Head of uh, Russia today, Margarita Somonyan, uh, that lovely example of a human being, called for the assassination of Senator Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, I reported yesterday, was saying the best money that the US has ever spent, basically, in helping Ukraine to win the war. And he sort of talked about the death of Russian soldiers, death of Russians. And then the, the Russia ob obviously weren't going to take take that nicely were they take that well uh, she invoked the name of pavel sudopolatov who was involved in several intelligence operations including the assassination of leon trotsky uh, so he uh, yeah he is enemy number one lindsey graham at the moment and uh, yeah calling on his assassination well to add to that we don't have to exchange storm shadows we should just make a political decision which is obviously yet to be made Level everything they currently call Kiev or Ukraine. So this is uh, well done to the uh, Russian propagandists here for advocating just complete destruction of another country that they invaded. Uh, we, we're going to demilitarize it by flattening it. Just nothing these guys say, say is remotely morally acceptable. And that is yet another example. Anyway, on to other geopolitical things. Uh, Erdogan has won the Turkish presidential election. What does that mean for Ukraine? I guess we are yet to see. I mean, 
really Ukraine would have been wanting the opposition, I think, to win. And the opposition was slightly more uh, NATO and westward looking. But Erdogan has won. And Erdogan is very much a foot in both on both sides of the fence. Uh, he loves a bit of Russian money and loves also to be a linchpin in NATO decisions, you know, um, the accession of Finland. Yeah, he's the, he's holds the key there to NATO and the accession of Sweden to NATO. Will that happen? Well, that's up to him. Uh, now, if if he was truly westward looking, it, there would be, yeah, right, yeah, you, you guys need to be in there. We need to stop this war and Sweden being part of NATO is going to help that. But it's all a bit, mm, uh, but then also they are giving a load of equipment to Ukraine. They're not always uh, headlining that, but it is getting there. There's a lot of Turkish equipment that's helping Ukraine. So it's a funny one, Turkey. They really are playing, you know, talking out both sides of the mouth. Uh, but it, I, it would have been better if the opposition had got in, not just for my own personal political positioning, but actually I think as far as Ukraine is concerned, I, I think the opposition would have been uh, uh, preferable. But they didn't actually talk too much about that in the election. It wasn't like a big election uh, they've got huge problems economically speaking huge problems with inflation in fact the turkish bank has has basically done a load of stuff to benefit erdogan so that the economy there wasn't a run on the lira and the economy didn't tank in the lead up to the election uh, so basically he's got his bank to just about make him not look like a an economic plonker uh, and that's that uh, I presume would have really helped him. Um, I, I may be wrong with that. That's just my quick analysis of the situation. Um, OK, and just the last thing, cause, because I mentioned renewables yesterday, I thought this was quite an interesting headline in, in one of the papers today. Ukraine has built more onshore wind turbines in the past year than England, and they're in the middle of a battle. In fact, one of the, one of the onshore wind uh, power plants, if you like, is just 60 kilometres from the front line. Uh, in uh, Mikhailov. So, yeah, interesting. And and Miliband, whose uh, opposition was the Labour Party leader a couple of years back, and ran for PM and didn't get in. But he is saying that you know it's a terrible indictment that a war torn country is is doing better on renewables than than the UK. Now this is onshore wind turbines, and that's a little bit different to offshore. We're we're Still pretty big on offshore because we have one of the best, in some say, the best country in the world for offshore wind. Wind um, Onshore is a little bit more controversial, and the present government put a kibosh basically on that, which is why you'll see that there's only two turbines in the whole of England. Two turbines, I think, in the whole of England were built last year. Um, whereas, you know, the Ukraine have built an entire wind farm and so on and so forth. Anyway, I just thought that that was just an interesting thing to add. Please like, subscribe and share. Thank you so much for watching and choosing to uh, to spend your time with me watching this stuff. I really appreciate that. Um, take care and I'll speak to you soon.